Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Mr. Guthrie. Oh, I mean, Lieutenant Guthrie. I'm sorry. That's well, okay. Don't apologize. Smoke? I got my pipe, thanks. Mm-hmm. We uh, think we might have the man you saw going into Mr. Frankly's house this afternoon. Well, say, that's quick work. You fellas really go after everything, don't you? <laughs> we try to. Yeah, I only saw him for a minute, but I think I can remember him by the pants and the jacket he was wearing. Well, I hope you can remember his face, May too, I Mr. May I have Bannon. your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the washroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, move it right along, all the way over to the end of the street. Uh, Lieutenant, hmm? uh, right, there's the man right up there. Oh, oh which one? Uh, that Turn tall fella. Hmm. Well, uh, let's wait till he's questioned. You, number 10, face the front. The front. <laughs> all right, keep your eyes straight ahead. When I call your number, step out to the circle, answer the question so the people out there can hear you. Okay, number one, Jack Hanley, burglary. Where do you live? I live you, Oregon. Come on, you'll have to speak up, Jack. I live in Bayview, Oregon. Now, look, I've told you what every officer you've met around here has told you. When we ask you where you live, we want the address you slept at the night before you were arrested. Is that clear? The rest of you understand it? Okay, Jack. I don't remember. Some flea bag on East Arapahoe Street. Who remembers that kind of an address? Were you alone when you were arrested? No, I was drinking beer with a friend. What was his name? His name's Lorraine Price. Have a gun on you, Jack? Uh, when? When you were arrested. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, what kind? A Webley Fosbury automatic. V8 shot? Yes, right at 38. Hey, I'll be here a few days. Drop this. Say hello. We can talk about guns. Thanks. I'll do that. Okay, number two, Frederick Hammer, assault. Come on, come on. Hustle it up, Frederick. Where do you live? 5162 South Central. Louder so the people can hear you, Freddy. I ain't got nothing to say. Well, you had quite a bit to say at dinner time tonight. Every cook in the jail kitchen heard you. I don't like your job. You'll get used to it. The address again. 5162 South Central. Stand up straight. Take your hands out of your pockets. I was looking for my lighter. It's in the property room. What do you do for a living? Truck driver. How much do you weigh? 218. Do you know a man named Frank Yacino? Yeah, I know him. Do you know how much Frank weighs? How much? 132. He may not weigh much, but he's got an awful big mouth on him, I tell you that. We heard all about it, Freddy. Can I help it if he falls down and cuts his lip? Concussion. Percussion, percussion, who cares? Okay, step back. You ought to be here stuff. That's me. enough, that's enough. Number three, Rex Gilman, open charge. Where do you live, Rex? 36, uh, 17 that Plymouth Avenue. Like right right take your time. How long do you live there? Yes, uh, since 47. What's your business? Mechanic. Own a car? I have a 41. Yeah, yeah, that's him, Lieutenant. Yes, I, I've what been color? certain of it ever since he walked out on that stage. Okay. <laughs> Sergeant Graham. Uh, yes, sir. Number three, hold for interrogation. Uh, 
Hi, Ben. Hi. How's Mr. Franklin? Uh, about the same. My phone's pretty bad. A lot of internal bleeding, three transfusion so far. Oh. Uh, any luck with Frankly's wife? Uh, divorced in 1948 and after 23 years of marriage. She's remarried, living in San Francisco now, a wired. Uh, Cargo's at the hospital sweating it out now. I relieve him at midnight. Nash will follow up about four. Frankly has anything to say, we'll get it done. Good. No prints on the kitchen knife that make any sense. We're still hoping on some they picked up on a glass. What about Gilman? Uh, Borton identified him. Hey, uh, Claude Abrams is in your office. He's Frankly's attorney. Advised frankly on how to handle the thing with Gilman. Met him at the hospital. Oh. Mr. Abrams, this is Lieutenant Guthrie. Oh, glad to meet you, Lieutenant. Now, how do you do? Uh, keep your seat, Mr. Abrams. Oh. I understand you advised Mr. Frankly about this matter with Gilman, Mr. Abrams. Yes, I explained that he could take it to court, but I tried to talk him out of taking action because of the expense involved. However, he insisted. I even called on Gilman at his garage and explained what Mr. Frankly was going to do. Hoping Gilman might rectify his mistake or refund the money. Now, what was Gilman's attitude? Persecuted. Called Mr. Frankly several names. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Frankly have plenty of money? Almost a quarter of a million dollars. You still got it? All except what Lillian, his wife, took from him. Seems funny he'd create so much ruckus over a small matter like this with a garage man if he has all that money. <laughs> well, I uh, won't keep you any longer, Mr. Abrams. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh... Mr. Frankly ever mentioned someone named uh, Fay? Oh, not that I recall. We didn't mix socially. He mentioned the name several times in coma. Uh, Lieutenant, do you think that garage man did this to Mr. Franklin? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Abrams. Okay. Just sit in that chair, Gilman. Okay. No, 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 no. That one. Fine. Okay. My name's Ben Guthrie. You know Sergeant Greb. You know why you're here? Something about Frankly. He's in pretty serious condition, Gilman. He's beaten up and stabbed. We picked you up because we learned that you had words with Frankly about some work you did for him. What about it? Well, I did what he asked me to do. I put white sidewalls on his tires, and I told him I couldn't guarantee the job. When it didn't work out and they turned yellow, he got nasty about it. I told him to stay away from my garage. Did you threaten Mr. Frankly? No, I didn't threaten him. I just told him he better not try to take me to court over it, a little thing like that. What did you mean when you told him that? Well, I meant that he better not do it, that's all. Well, what I want to know is uh, what alternative action did you have in mind? None. I, I just didn't want him to do it. It's kind of hot in here. Can I... No, you were talking about the tire business. You must have had something in mind. I suppose I did. I don't know. What? I don't know. And what's the matter with your hand? I was reaching for the light switch in the dark, and the back of my hand touched the wall. It's rough plaster. Well, it seems to me you'd put the palm of your hand against the wall to feel for the switch. There's an extra wall by my switch. It's just a little office they built in when I leased the joint. You have to go in sort of like, like this, and that's the wall I brush. With the back of your hand? Yeah. I, I don't quite get the picture there. What is it, a little partition or what that comes out by the switch? It's just part of the wall in a little area. And you hit it with the back of your hand, reaching for the light switch. Look, if you don't believe me, mister, go down and look for yourself. Or send one of your sergeants down there. Maybe one of them's got brains enough to figure out how it could happen. Well, maybe. You know, you guys make me sick with your questions. If, if the answer you get doesn't ring the bell, you're going to be real tough about it. Real tough. Don't sit there. Sit here. Don't take off your coat. Don't raise the window. Don't smoke. Nuts. You guys make me sick. Sergeant, lieutenant. But I'll laugh. Just like those wonder boys I ran into in the army. They didn't know how to do anything but keep their pants pressed and their shaving gear two inches from their toothbrushes and field inspection. I've seen enough of you cops today to last me all my life. You really make me sick. Anything else, Gilman? Yeah. When you're out pounding around waiting for that 30 years to end so you can get your rocking chair money, I'll be able to buy and sell both of you and all the rest of these guys around here. <laughs> well, 
When Sergeant Asher and Sergeant Quine questioned you earlier, did they ask you if you had seen Mr. Frankly today? Yeah. What did you tell them? I told them no. Did they ask you if you'd gone over to his house today? Sure. Well? I told him no. Doesn't quite check, Gilman. Mr. Borden lives right across the street from Mr. Frankly's house. He picked you out of the lineup tonight and identified you as the man who went up the walk to Mr. Frankly's house about 1.30 today. Okay. Okay, I was there. Where? At Frankly's house. At 1.30? Yeah, but he wasn't there. I didn't see him. I... Now, look, you guys, I went over there to see him about the attachment and the summons. He sued me for that lousy little bill. He wasn't home. I tied up my bank account this morning with some kind of a writ night. Well, he wasn't there. Look, do you think I beat him up and stick a knife in him for that? When you went to his house, did you ring the bell? No. Did you knock? No. Look, I was pretty hot about the attachment and the summons. When I got to the house, I thought maybe he'd see me coming up the walk from his window or something and wouldn't answer the door. So I just opened it and and walked in. I wanted to see him. I could say things to him in his house that I couldn't say to him in a courtroom. Things about the white side walls? Yeah. What'd you see in his house? What'd I see? Nothing. He, He wasn't around. I yelled his name a couple of times and then left. Did you go through the house? No. Not even to the kitchen? No. After you left his house, where'd you go? Back to my garage. The boy at your garage told Sergeant Asher you didn't get back until after 3 o'clock. Well, I I stopped and had lunch. I forgot. What'd you have for lunch? Well, I stopped at some beanery on Tremont Street. I found a parking place, and then I had a sandwich and a couple of beers. Uh Uh-huh. We asked you earlier if you'd been to Frankly's house this afternoon. You said you hadn't. Why did you deny that you'd been there? What do you mean? Well, what are we supposed to think, Rex? We're trying to find out what happened to Mr. Frankly. You tried to hide that part of it from us. We'll have to hold you. Check into your story more thoroughly. Well, how are you going to check what I told you? I didn't have anyone around to prove he wasn't there in the house when I went in. Oh, you're wrong. There's one witness, Gilman. Who? Lawrence Frankly. Tomorrow night, most of these same stations bring you Earl Wrightson and Alfredo Antonini's orchestra with Jimmy Carroll and a fine singing cast in a musical salute to Rogers and Hart. Hear composer Richard Rogers himself and hear the wonderful show tunes Rogers and Hart penned for unforgettable Broadway productions. That's tomorrow night, part of your Friday night family music parade on CBS Radio. Scrub these places with ether? <laughs> I don't think they even use it anymore. It always smells the same. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Matt. Hi. Hi. Just in time. Down here. Think you'll make it? Well, we'll keep trying. Don't take too long. He's awfully weak. I want to put him under sedative as soon as you're finished. Okay, Dan. Now, look. When we get in the room, Gilman... Just keep your mouth shut, do what you're told. Uh, uh, better put your cigarette in that. Oh. Okay, now remember what I said. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Ash is in with him now. Please state your full name. Up close to the bed, Gilman. All right. Lawrence J. Franklin. Where do you live? 32, 32 Humboldt. How old are you, Mr. Franklin? I'm 53. I understand that you're seriously hurt. Is that true? Well, that's what the doctors tell me. Are you willing to make a true and full statement of how and in what manner you came to the injury from which you're suffering? Closer, Gilman. Closer. Right under the light. Can you hear me, Mr. Franklin? Yes. 
Who caused the injury from which you're suffering? Was it this man? Do you recognize him? Yes. Gilman, the man at the garage. Did he cause you these injuries? I did. Shut I... up. Mr. Frankly? What? Is Rex Gilman the man who beat you up and attacked you with a knife in your home today? Mr. Frankly, we have good reason to believe this man attacked you. Will you please tell us if he's the one? Mr. Frankly. No. Rex Gilman did not attack you? No. Hey, what did I tell I you? I told you to shut up. Well, who did attack you, Mr. Frankly? Who did this to you? It was a woman. Well, what was her name, Mr. Frankly? Where can we find her? Uh, I, I... You've been repeating the name Faye in your delirium. Uh, was it Faye? Faye who? Go away. I, I don't want to have anything done about it. Mr. Frankly, I... Doc. That's all, Ben. <sighs> you guys, I, I told you. Get him out of here, Matt. Come on. I told you. You guys are going to look pretty silly, boy. Oh, I will wait till I open up my mouth. There'll be newspaper I can find. Let's get the floor orderly and notify the morgue. he knew what he was saying. Well, you heard him answer everything else. Yeah. Well, here's everything we could dig up, Ben. Okay. Frankly, he's been having a time for himself ever since his divorce three years ago. Advertised in the papers and joined a Lonely Hearts Club. Met several women. Hmm. A man like Frankly using that means to meet a woman. <laughs> Sound funny to you, Ben? Yeah. Well, maybe he had something definite in mind about the kind of woman he wanted to meet. Well, he saw three of them pretty regularly, all fairly young for him. Hmm. Ellen Bennett, age 29, a city stenographer. Madge Givens, age 29, the city waitress. Laura Vickers, age 31, the city also waitress. No one named Faye. Second names? Mm, Helen May, Madge Diana, Laura Christine. Well, we have enough suspects. Yeah, and more coming. He was having all sorts of fun. Cargo and Murph are trying to locate the Givens woman. Laura Vickers, married eight months ago, lives out on the coast. Helen Bennett's in the interrogation room with Patterson Carter. She says Frankly asked her to marry him last month. She turned him down. They're still talking to her. Mm. Hi. Hi. Billy and Grant came up with something. Oh? Been re-questioning people in the neighborhood. Woman came to see Frankly twice last week. Saw him often. Drove a new CAD convertible, blue. Well, that doesn't sound like a waitress or stenographer. Well, what about these? Uh, nothing like them. This one's in early 40s. Blonde, nice-looking, well-groomed. Three different people who remember seeing her said she was one of those kind you could give 10 or 12 more years and still not tell the difference. Anything on the car? No license number. man named Masterson was pretty sure he's noticed a Cherry Hills plate frame on it. No cab dealers in Cherry Hills. We're checking dealers all over town. Uh, I put some men on auto supply stores, too. If she bought the plate frames, one of them might have put them on for her. Mm -hmm. Better call Park Hill Division. That's nearest to Cherry Hills. Give them the stuff you have. Blue cad convertibles aren't too plentiful even there. Okay. Oh, I talked to your witness, Borden, again. You remember her? Yeah. Said she always wore nice sport clothes. When the weather was nicer, saw her come by one day with some golf clubs stacked in the back of her car. Mm -hmm. Guthrie. Uh, Carger just called in. Tracked down Frankly's landlady. Name's Faye Seelig. Good. What's the address? 2479 Vista, Cherry Hills. Right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Lieutenant Guthrie, police. Miss Sergeant Greb. May we come in, please? Well, yes. May I have your coats? Well, that won't be necessary. I'm only going to stay a minute. Uh, we'd like to get a little information from you, if possible, about Lawrence Franklin. Oh? 
Uh, yes, we understand you were his landlady. I own the house on Humboldt Street. Larry rented it from me, but I dislike the title landlady. Oh, sorry. I uh, suppose you read about his death in the papers. Yes, of course. I was very upset over it. I've known Larry for a long time. Well, uh, maybe you can tell us something that'll give us a hint as to what actually happened at his home last Tuesday afternoon. Well, I'm sure I don't know. In his coma, Mr. Frankly mentioned the name Faye several times. Now, that's your name, isn't it? Yes. Do you have any idea why he'd mention your name? No, no idea. Well, according to people our men have talked to in the neighborhood, you drop by to see Mr. Frankly quite often. What people? Oh, just people in the neighborhood. Was he a good friend of yours? He was an old friend of Doug's, my late husband. Why would these people talk to you about me? Well, they didn't talk about you, Mrs. Seeley. They just remembered you and the car you drove and that you saw Mr. Frankly quite often. That's why you're here? That's right. When was the last time you visited Mr. Frankly? Oh, last month, I think. Do you know Helen Bennett? Should I? Mr. Frankly was intending to marry her at one time not so long ago. Thought he might have mentioned it to you. No. Larry, contemplating a second marriage, I'm surprised. Well, he was in good health, had money, no responsibilities. Seemed good marriage material. Oh, you misunderstand me. I've always thought of Larry as a wonderful catch, but he often mentioned to me that he'd never trust another woman and that he'd never marry again. When did he tell you that? Many times. Last week, in fact. Well, a moment ago, you said you hadn't seen him for over a month. Did you forget? Yes, I suppose I did. We had dinner together last week. Are you trying to confuse me? Now, uh, this is a personal question, Mrs. Seeley, but we'd appreciate an honest answer to it. Did you ever think of marrying Mr. Frankly yourself? I suppose so. Did you ever talk about it? I suppose we did, yes. But I've explained how he felt, and I've been quite aware of his feelings for some time. Well, what you say about Mr. Frankly's attitude toward women puzzles me, Mrs. Seeley. We've learned that he had correspondence with several saw two or three regularly, besides the woman named Helen Bennett. You're talking about that silly, lonely hearts thing, aren't you? Yes. Larry had an obtuse sense of humor, writing all those women and meeting them. A man with his education and social background and connections, honestly. I know all about it. It's been going on ever since Lillian left him. Well, we'd like to hear what you have to say about it, if you don't mind, Mrs. Seeley. Oh, dear, I'm late now. I have an appointment for lunch could, downtown. Uh, could you cancel it? I certainly could not. Mrs. Seelig, we're investigating a homicide. We've got to check into everything. You may be able to help us a great deal. Well, I'll... I'll try and telephone my friend. Excuse me, please. Uh, certainly. No. What do you think, Ben? Nice woman. Very attractive. Yeah. Boy, look at this. I'll bet this living room set cost two grand if it cost a bit. And hey, what was that? Well, it isn't a telephone. The bathroom? Yeah. It's locked. Okay, Matt. Yeah. Oh, she's taking something. Oh, no. What did you take, Mrs. Seely? I won't. Here it is, Ben. Oh, Lysol. The uh, kitchen must be in the back somewhere. Eggs or milk should do it. Yeah, right, Ben. I want to die. Now lie quiet, Mrs. Seely, and Joe don't Parker. talk. Can I have a minute to take a What are you doing? Quiet. Now, here. Drink it. No. Drink it. Here. Here we are, Ben. Okay. I'll get her head. All right, come on now. Try this. No. No. Go away. Oh. Anything I can do. Just a minute. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, it got down. hit him with my handbag. He started his ear to bleeding. When I hit him again, he stumbled and started toward me. I became very frightened. This all happened in the kitchen? Yes. All right, go on. He didn't try to hit me back, but he did try to hold my arms. I 
Saw the knife laying there on the board, and I used it. I thought he was dead when I left. You have no idea what it's like knowing he was with her. Are you talking about Helen Bennett? No, the others, too. I would have made Larry a good wife. We were perfectly matched. I told him I'd have been a wife he could take to his club and introduce to people. One he'd have been proud to do things with, travel and things. Yes. We'd have made a nice couple. But Mr. Frankly didn't want it that way. Is that it? He wanted something else. Them. Waitresses. Stenographers. Do I look 46 years old, Lieutenant? No, I wouldn't say so. My friends tell me I could pass for 35. Larry was nearly 50. Maybe past it. I could have made him happy. Certainly given him more than Lillian ever gave him. She let herself put on weight and didn't watch her clothes. A woman should keep herself up. Don't you think? Yes. Yes. We'd have made a nice couple. We could have had a wonderful life together. Before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, was written by E. Jack Newman with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Averback, Howard McNear, Lou Krugman, Dave Young, Bob Sweeney, Sidney Miller, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> Company hope you'll all be on hand to join them this Saturday evening when songbird Betty Cox drops in to sing. They'll all be heard on CBS radio as usual, and you're invited to help yourself to the Monroe style rhythm this Saturday evening on most of these same stations. speaking, and remember, you'll enjoy Theater of Today every Saturday in the daytime hours on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>